you don't really see the whole body of the crab. You just kind of see some dark claws and try to go after it. So, uh, you know, I, I was walking out there in my flip-flops for a while, but they tried to drown me a couple of times and trip me up. So I was like, all right, you know what, forget this. I'm just taking off flip-flops and walking barefoot. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. So in today's episode, we have Matt Burgess. He is a fisherman, um, something we don't talk about a lot that we've gotten some requests for. We're going to have a few more uh, later in the summer, so keep an ear out for that. If you ever want to suggest somebody for the show or a sport that we don't cover that often, reach out because what happens a lot of times is, you know, we get a guest and that leads to a few names, then we interview them. And so it can kind of stay in the same circle of people slash the same few sports for a while. Um, so if you've got something you want to hear, reach out to us. You can you can find that in the show notes. Um, just send an email, info at adventuresportspodcast.com. Um, but Matt here, he is a avid fisherman, knows a ton about reels and lures and rods and just all different kinds of fishing. Um, and he goes all over the world doing fishing trips, which is pretty cool. You know, that you, you can definitely travel to hunt, to fish, to do uh, trips kind of around those sports. Um, people, I mean, I grew up, tons of people I knew went, traveled all over the world to go hunting specifically. And so, uh, yeah, fishing's a really fun sport, man. If you've never done it, I highly encourage you to find a, a form of fishing that you can achieve, you can do, you can afford and, and give it a shot. Um, and obviously obey the laws and the rules of that area. But I doubt there's very few of you out there who've never, never been fishing. And if you haven't, come on, man, it's a pastime. You got to go fishing. Um, a few quick announcements. Uh, as you know, our adventure grant is open for another month. That is being funded by Athletic Brewing, and they are they and we are all we're giving away a thousand bucks to somebody doing an adventure in 2019. If you're planning something, you know somebody's planning something, have them apply because it's a thousand dollars on the line that can go a long way in a lot of adventures. I just talked to a guy today that biked around the world for four years on ten thousand U.S. dollars. So a thousand bucks is a tenth of that, <laughs> you know, that's like, I don't know, six months on the road or something for some people, if you live super, super cheap. But we also have a giveaway out with, uh, the nomadic that is in the show notes. Uh, check it out. They are a subscription box for outdoor gear. And so it's a little box you get it in the mail and uh, it's filled with outdoor stuff chosen by outdoor enthusiasts. And we're giving away to three people a free subscription box for that. The URL is in the show notes. Apply um, because you got a chance to win. I highly recommend it. Also, this episode is brought to you by CS Instant Coffee. They make really awesome 100% Arabica instant coffee that also has compostable packaging, so you can feel good about not using, you know, wasting single-serve plastic or something like that. Um, great stuff. We have a discount going with them as well. Check the show notes for that. Anytime you need to get a hold of us or, or find out more about the guests, their websites, any deals that are going on with the show, it's all in the show notes. But all right, we really appreciate all the, the sharing and the growth. We had our best month ever for April. April was by far our best month of all time, which is freaking awesome. So we continue. Keep sharing the show. Um, keep telling your friends about it. I know we have a ton of episodes and not all of them are going to be grand slams, but we, we hit it out of the park more times than not, I like to think. 
Um, but anyway, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with us. Very excited to have you on board. And if you need any backpacking gear, any gear rentals stuff, you know, go over to campcrate.net. We can rent you some gear and send it anywhere in the country. All right, let's get into a topic that we don't cover that often, adventure fishing. So I guess I could really just start off with, you know, kind of how I got into, you know, fishing and kind of just where it all started, um, you know, being kind of passionate about the outdoors. But um, my very first fishing uh, trip I can remember is going out to a, a local forest reserve with my dad and my older brother. And I was about four years old and had a little Mickey Mouse pole that was probably taller than I was at the time. And uh, just kind of like a, a little, you know, push button reel and just tossing the hook in and uh, fishing for bluegill or whatever else would bite. And, uh, I'm pretty, I could vividly remember that first trip, uh, because I, I actually, as I was going out to try and cast and, you know, as a little kid, sometimes you just kind of hold the pole over the water and click the button and, you know, the hook goes down and that's it. But, uh, I saw my dad who had a, a pretty big catfish pole at that time and, you know, he's doing some over the shoulder casting. So I go try to do the same thing and I accidentally hook my brother's pole and knock it into the water, which, uh, you couldn't, you know, see it. As a dad to be, you could even imagine, you know, having two kids there both crying. My brother's crying because his pole's in the water. I'm crying because I'm sure he hit me after that. But, uh, you know, that was the, the first, you know, spot that really started it all. And, you know, every summer my dad would take us to local lakes and, you know, just really easy fishing off the shore, not too much off, you know, um, going off onto lakes like I've done now and the, most recently. But, um, yeah, and that's just kind of really where, I fell in love with the outdoors and just being in nature and yeah. Wow. So, so it's, you know, grown up, it was the typical fishing, not typical, but you know, kind of the, the storybook fishing set up, you know, you're on a dock or something with a couple little lines, the click, the click reels and, uh, yep. and then it just evolves into just, I mean, there's just t- so many types of fishing now. What, which ones do you prefer and which ones have you done? Yeah, um, so I haven't done much fly fishing. Um, you know, there's a couple rivers out here local to me that, um, you know, some guys do it, but it's definitely one part of, of the sport that I really haven't gotten into, um, which just like any other hobby, you know, there's so many different kind of, you know, offshoots of, of where people really find what, what their passion is about it. But, you know, I would say for me, um, you know, mostly bass fishing it is probably the my favorite. It's really where I spend most of my time, um, kind of in the Midwest area. If you're a little bit more south towards, you know, Illinois, southern Wisconsin border, largemouth bass are typically, um, you know, more, I guess, more available, really, like most of the lakes here have, you know, largemouth bass. Um, a little bit tougher to find smallmouth in, in this area. You might find them in the rivers. Um, but when you go up to Wisconsin out there in the lakes, you get a lot of smallmouth, um, you know, action. There's a lake that we've been going to. It's in Tomahawk, Wisconsin. Um, and they've got a lot of good smallmouth up there, which, um, you know, relative to, you know, smallmouth, uh, or uh, largemouth rather, smallmouth for as, as small as they are, put up a heck of a fight. Um, uh, you know, they always say pound for pound, they're the, they're the hardest fighting fish out there. Uh, when you get, you know, I've, had a spinner bait out once on uh, Lake Mahogasin and had a smallmouth hit. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I must have this ginormous fish. And, you know, outcome was probably like a one-pound small of a smallmouth. And, um, <laughs> you know, so it's definitely a little bit of a difference there. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I would I would say mostly that. Um, I started getting into musky fishing a little bit. Uh, so about two years ago, uh, that same friend of mine went up to uh, Wisconsin again and did some uh, musky fishing, which... Uh, is a lot different than bass fishing. So bass fishing, you might have, say, you know, a, a rod that's like medium or light action. Um, so like the medium or light action, basically, you know, how stiff the rod is. Um, you know, if it's got lighter, you're going to be able to feel smaller fish and one on there. You're going to be able to know when to set the hook versus if you try to use, you know, that same rod for, say, a, a muskie, it might break. You know, you could catch a, a 60-pound muskie and that, that small bass rod's just not going to hold up. And so musky fishing, you're going to have a different type of reel as well. You'll have like a big caster reel with some, you know, heavier line on there. And, uh, if you ever get a chance to Google, uh, musky lures, some of them look like small boats that you're heaving out there. So, uh, you know, some of those lures can get up there and wait as well and have massive hooks on there. And, 
the difference with musky fishing versus, you know, something like a bass or um, like smallmouth or even panfish like crappie is um, they call the musky a fish of a thousand casts because, you know, the older that they get, they just get really, really smart at, about identifying lures and stuff like that. So you could have, um, you know, muskies that have a certain territory that have probably seen every lure that you've got in your tackle box. And it's all about getting out there at the right time and having the right presentation and um, yeah, it's something that's pretty newer for me. Um, you know, I've, we went out there with a guide and he was saying, make sure you reel that bait all the way into the water. Cause you know, a muskie will, will swim all the way up and just kind of watch it move the whole time before it actually strikes. And, um, you know, sure enough, we're on the boat and we see a couple of just, it's funny cause you'll just see a flash of the scales, you know, after your lure and you're thinking, oh, I almost had it, you know, or, um, and so that's definitely been something new that I've been trying as well. You you do a lot of fishing at home as well as going on trips. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the local lakes um, where I'm at, um, like I said, they're pretty populated areas. I'm, I'm in the suburbs of Chicago, so um, they get fished quite a bit. Um, you know, there's even um, a place out here where they do ice fishing. Um, that's pretty local at a, at a state park, uh, and so I find the the like the stock of fish is. Um, a lot less dense than going up to somewhere where, you know, it's a town of 1,500 people and the only people that are going up there are on fishing trips. So I uh, definitely get out as much as I can. Um, you know, we were talking about the whole family lifestyle and, you know, I don't get to go out as much as I, as I did before. But, um, you know, once uh, winter breaks, which we're getting pretty close to here now, right, spring's opening up. I think we actually got pretty close to 60 degrees today. So we'll definitely try to get out more and um, most of my trips that are local, you know, I don't, I don't go out with high expectations, you know, maybe I've got a new piece of tackle that I really want to try out or, um, you know, a new reel set up that, you know, I really want to be able to practice with and, and, you know, see how it feels or new lures that I want to you know, see how the action's at, see how my cast is. That way once, you know, I do have a big trip coming up or, you know, I'm out on the lake, I'm not trying to figure out a new reel or trying to, you know, getting frustrated because it's not working the way I wanted it to. Yeah, man, living in the suburbs of Chicago, how how close is the, I don't know, closest place you like to fish? Because that seems like the pretty opposite of anything outdoorsy. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, living in the suburbs is, is great for you know work and business and and all those things. But um, you know, so I'm about oh I don't know, maybe a mile and a half from uh, what's called the Fox River. Um, so the Fox River um, actually starts all the way up in Wisconsin, I believe. And uh, so it's a pretty big river. There's there's plenty of, uh, of fish in it that you can go into. Uh, you got like a fish on smallmouth in there, an alligator gar. There's actually a guy uh, maybe about a year or two ago that uh, caught a muskie probably a couple miles north up up river from us, which is pretty rare too. Um, definitely try to get out local as much as he can. Um, and then uh, there's a yearly trip that I go up to Wisconsin, mostly tomahawk. Um, you know, boundary water type areas that uh, we try to get there at least once a year, uh, usually in the summer for, you know, bass, smallmouth, and walleye fishing. Uh, uh, we usually go again in the fall. Okay. Yeah, I got that. And then um, also did my first, um, you know, saltwater uh, expedition uh, December. So um, kind of backed everything up and uh, we did a trip out to Australia, uh, which was, uh, pretty cool. It, it lined up. My wife's got some family out there uh, that we were able to stay with, so that definitely helped. And um, you know, she was my wife was actually uh, credit to her for setting up, being able to do some uh, you know some crab fishing out there, and then also uh, some saltwater fishing, which uh, I hadn't done before. So uh, when they started to talk about it, the people we were traveling with, and uh, so it was my brother-in-law and some of his friends that uh, he knew out there. I was I wasn't quite sure what I was getting myself into. I didn't know if this was going to be, you know, deep sea fishing. We're going to be out in the middle of nowhere on a, on a boat or, uh, or fishing offshore. And so we ended up fishing offshore. And, uh, so we spent most of the day kind of by the beach and, you know, just kind of enjoying the family, cooking out and starting to get a little bit darker and a little bit darker. I'm thinking, man, you know, when are, when are we going to get out there? When are we, when are we going to start fishing? So, um, they're like, ah, just wait a little bit more, wait a little bit more. And the uh, sun goes down, and uh, we ended up walking out to this jetty of just, you know, random rocks right on the shore, and uh, waves crashing in that uh, don't look too favorable if I were to fall in. And uh, I'm standing there in, in flip-flops with a, with a nine-foot rod just casting out into the ocean. Uh, and it's, it's pretty much pitch black out there. You can't really see much. And 
uh, for it being Australia in December, I was expecting it to be a lot warmer than it was, but I was in a, you know, shorts and flip-flops trying not to kill myself on the rocks. And meanwhile, it's like 50 degrees. So it got pretty cold, uh, pretty quickly. And, um, yeah, you know, we fished with, you know, they just had, um, I can't, I can't even remember exactly what kind of bait fish it was, but just small bait for it, fish and throw it on a hook. And, uh, we hook it through the back, um, and toss it out there. And, you know, as soon as the waves start crashing it in towards the, the rocks that we're standing on, you reel in and go again. But, uh, there's a little bit of a precarious situation as I'm sitting there, you know, like I said, trying not to fall as I'm heaving my bait out there. And I actually did catch a, a Taylor fish. So I was pretty happy about that. It was my first saltwater catch. And, uh, we were, we we're going to take it back and grill them up. But, uh, <laughs> one of the guys that helped me, uh, you know, as I'm out there, cause it's, it's pretty tough to stand on, you know, you're, maybe like a six inch little platform that you're standing on jagged rocks below you and, and above you. She was helping me take the fish off and actually fell in between the rocks. So we weren't able to get out. So it's kind of a, a sad ending to, to my first saltwater catch there. Wow. So you, so you haven't done any saltwater fishing before that? No. Yeah. That wow. was the, that was the first time out there. Um, but I, I definitely love it. Um, you know, my, my brother lives out in Tampa and he does a lot of kayaking out in the Tampa Bay area. And, um, you know, he's doing some kayaking and fishing, so he's showing me all these catches and get a little bit jealous about uh, just, you know, being stuck to the lakes out here in the, in the Midwest. So, um, you know, we've got a trip coming up in April that uh, we'll go out to Bermuda and uh, do some saltwater fishing out there. So uh, as far as the Atlantic goes, it's world-renowned for its marlin fishing out there. So uh, we're going to see what we can get our hands on and, uh, and just continue to spread out. Um, you know, I'm definitely more of your uh, recreational fishermen. I definitely uh, haven't done, you know, bass fishing tournaments or anything like that. That that competitive side of, of the sport definitely gets pretty intense. Um, you know, Backpack Tribe actually sponsors a, a, an amateur fisherman out of Michigan, and he's telling me all the, you know, different things that he's got to go into it. And it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more than just showing up with a boat and, and throwing a line out there. Uh, like I'm used to, you know, he's spotting the lakes out days ahead of time and, you know, reviewing notes from his last time that he fished and checking out certain spots. And, um, you know, it's, it's got a different feel to it when you're doing it competitively versus uh, just being out there for a recreational trip and, and just trying to, you know, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the outdoors. Yeah, man. No kidding. So you, where else have you gone fishing just to travel to fish? Yeah, so uh, traveling to fish, so Australia was a, really the first big one, um, like I just mentioned. So that was out in Perth, on the uh, western side of Australia. Uh, did some trips out in Ontario. Uh, so there was one spot, um, which, again, i got to thank my wife for that. That was actually part of our honeymoon. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how many wives would let uh, would let their husband go fishing in that part of, uh, part of their honeymoon, but... Uh, Mine did, and I'm, and I'm very grateful. So uh, it was actually, um, you know, we drove through, and that was probably the most convenient part of it. You know, I, I definitely um, wouldn't recommend trying to shove all your fishing gear into luggage and, and fly in there. It's, that's pretty difficult, and it, it is probably a little bit easier to rent or just have some people that you know where you're going. Um, but driving through, so we did a road trip through Michigan into uh, Canada and came through, um, Detroit and, you know, hit up Toronto. And then we went into Ontario. So I was able to actually pack all my fishing stuff into, uh, into the truck on the road trip there. You know, the farther north you get to certain species like muskie or northern pike, um, uh, it has to do with the colder water. They're, they're able to grow to a lot bigger size than, uh, what I can experience locally. And so, um, get more chances to catch a walleye up there. Um, and if you haven't had walleye, I recommend it. It's great eating, uh, great fish to eat. Oh man, no, I've never, I've never had it. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely uh, give it a shot. There's actually a, a local uh, fish market out by us that sells late caught walleye, which is pretty good. But uh, so yeah, so Ontario, Wisconsin, uh, also Minnesota as well. Uh, so did some fishing out of Lake Minnetonka. Um, yeah, I had the, the 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 pleasure of living in Minnesota for a little over a year and. Uh, it's, you know, land of 10,000 lakes, so there's plenty of opportunities out there to, to get uh, get a line in the water and, and some great fishing as well. And, um, you know, it really just depends on, you know, what you're what you're trying to fish for. You know, obviously, if you're thinking of, you know, they want to, you know, somebody's thinking about a trip and they want to go catch, you know, a 
thousand pound marlin or something crazy. Uh, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but uh, you know, then obviously they're going to be looking at saltwater um, places, which some of those expeditions can can get pretty pricey. You know, so if you're looking at you know somewhere in Bermuda to 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 fish for um, for marlin, I mean. Some of those expeditions can be three grand just for a day of fishing to get out. Then that's not really a guarantee that you're going to hook one. Um, you know, so it really from a from a travel perspective, you know, the the research that goes into it ahead of time is always a plus. You know, if, what I would typically pay attention to is just the size of the lake, and you know, take a look at you know pictures that you know they've got online and see what they've been catching before. <clears throat> um, and those are all good indications of what kind of time we're going to have. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I really appreciate the more uh, kind of remote adventure. Um, you know, when we were fishing out in Canada, you know, I kind of just turned off the boat motor. We just kind of threw an anchor down. We were sitting there fishing. And I just told my wife, like, do you hear that? She's like, what? It's like complete silence. <laughs> you know, it was all you heard around you was just nature. And, um, you know, really some of those times are the, the best times out there. That's, um, you know, we have nothing but wildlife surrounding you all around. It's um, definitely a better atmosphere. Um, again, being on the recreational side of it, you know, I'm not always out there, you know, needing a, a trophy, right? I, I just want to be out there on the water and, um, yeah, it's great to see, you know, bald eagles flying around you and swooping down towards the, towards the water, trying to catch fish as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's really more part of the experience from, from a travel perspective for me. Um, and again, you know, larger lakes are going to require different equipment too. So, I mean, you know, the, the equipment you would bring to go fish um, in Bermuda or you know, Australia isn't the same that I'm going to take up with me to, to Wisconsin in June. You know, it's just going to be, you know, saltwater reels typically. You know, they've got to be a little bit beefier and have better material to prevent, you know, from corrosion. And uh, all the saltwater takes a little bit more toll on, on deer than, than freshwater does. And, and so you're going to be looking at, you know, different types of deer, like I said, and, and different strength of line as well. Um, the type of fish that you can catch out in the ocean is, is going to be, you know, like I said, you could catch a, you know, three, 400 pound um, marlin or you could catch, you know, a giant grouper, which are, you know, massive as well. And I can't really fish for that with my, with my uh, large mouth bass pole that I would use in Illinois. It's just not going to hold up. So um, and that's kind of where the different types of gear come into play. It's, you know, what are you, what are you looking to catch and, you know, what are you hoping for? Um, you know, the larger species, the bigger trophy fish that people typically want to go after are going to require, you know, a lot of gear. And if you're just an amateur and you're just out there, you know, just wanting to catch anything, um, you know, that's great. You know, grab a grab a small pool and, and throw a line out versus, you know, um, if you're really trying to catch that, that trophy, it might be better best to go with, you know, an, a paid expedition where, you know, they've got the heavy-duty gear and they've got, you know, the big, you know, big cast and reels and saltwater gear that's going to be able to help out with that. Athletic Brewing is pioneering non-alcoholic craft beer. Yeah, I said non-alcoholic craft beer. And there's a number of reasons you might want to do that. Whether you're training for an event, which a lot of our listeners are, or, you know, if, you, if you're babysitting and don't want to be drunk in case something happens. I mean, stuff happens, but you still want to sit down and enjoy the game and have a beer. This is an incredible option for a full-flavored, full-bodied beer. Each can is only 50 to 70 calories. With IPA, golden ale, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings, Athletic Brewing is a great option if you want that craft brewery taste. Uh, but not deal with the effects of alcohol itself. Uh, if you'd like to save 15% on your first order, go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout. Wow, man. So so how much gear do you do you have personally? Um, you know, I, I try to keep it pretty moderate. Um, you know, I, I my buddy Pete, if he's going to listen to this, he's probably going to, uh, be pissed if I mention his, uh, his old tackle box that he had. It was, it was massive. I mean, it was probably half of, uh, you know, your tackle store inside of it with all these different types of lures. And, <laughs> you know, I, I it, it was, you know, it had to weigh 50 pounds. I don't know. And I'm sure he'll, he'll blow up my phone up later saying it wasn't that heavy, but, uh, there was just a ton of stuff in there. Uh, for me, I, I keep it pretty simple. Um, you know, especially if it's just, you know, the bass fishing gear that I've got. Um, you know, I, I have a, a sling, soft sided sling, uh, tackle box with, you know, my soft plastics. Um, so I guess there's different types that you can go for, for bass fishing. You know, you got, 
live bait where you can go to you know any bait shop up there and you know pick up uh, you know min- a bucket of minnows or even uh, night crawlers and you know throw those on a hook and a bobber and, and throw it out and you'd be fine you know, you'll definitely catch something um, or you can go to or towards more of fake bait like lures um, crank baits um, or jigs or even um, uh, like soft plastic so those are kind of like imitation worms and there's hundreds of different kinds of ways that you can rig those up um, you know, you got like a Texas rig, Carolina rigs, uh, you got the wacky worm rigs, you got, um, you know, they got one with a O ring on it that you hook the, uh, put the hook through. Um, and those are all different, just different presentations. And so, you know, the way I set my gear up is, you know, I have a little bit of the soft plastic stuff that I'm going to use. I have a couple of jigs in there and then I have, you know, my section four, uh, crank baits. And I also have a, a section that I've got a bunch of spinner baits that I use and, uh, and more assorted, uh, colors. Uh, I don't want to be lugging all that gear around all day, and, and uh, I'm, I'm more li- I'm less likely to use all of it anyways. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, to be seasonal, or depending on what type of, of lake you're going to. So, um, you know, I've got maybe let's see here, probably have three or four different rods and, and, and real setups, and then on the the tackle side of things, I got maybe. Probably three or three hundred bucks worth of, of words and, and stuff like that that I've accumulated over time. It's really not something that you need to go and buy all at once, but you find a couple things that, that work and then, uh, you usually stick with it, especially if you're going to the same lake over and over again. Um, you know, on the, the yearly trip that I go to, we typically have gone to the, to the same lake. And so year after year, you're just going to know what works. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because, uh, we actually found these uh, lipless crankbaits that, that work really, really well. Um, and so I, I guess I should describe. So there's some crankbaits that will have like a, a plastic lip on it, and some of those are designed to dive down to a certain depth so that as you reel the lure in, it's going to go to that depth. Um, others, um, you don't know, have a, a plastic lip that keep it on the surface so that as you're reeling in or you're working the rod, it'll kind of pop at the surface. Uh, it's just a different presentation. Uh, and these lipless crankbaits, uh, just can, they do dive down a little bit, um, but not as aggressive as something with the, with a plastic lip on it. And, uh, they rattle like all get out. They're super loud. It's times like there's times where you're reeling into the water. You can actually hear your bait rattling from, from when you're on the boat, which is, uh, pretty cool and, and helps attract, uh, helps attract the, the fish quite a bit as well. So, but yeah, as, as far as gear goes, you know, I have different setups. Um, I'm actually working on a, a new musky setup, um, for this year or so. Um, you know, I'll get a new, probably, I'll probably go with Daiwa, um, Daiwa reels and, uh, and do a, another rod as well as we try to just get more aggressive. So I've never personally caught a muskie yet. Like I said, it's that fish of a thousand, uh, thousand casts. And I could sit here and tell you, uh, you know, uh, fish stories about, I feel how I've had some pretty big ones on the end of the line. Yeah. I was, I was actually wanting to ask you what, what's, uh, what's some good fish stories you have, <laughs> some of your favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, there's that's that's one of them. So uh, you know, my uh, friend Pete was fishing up towards the front of the boat, and he had a muskie on the line. And right when he gets one on the line, I've got another one that's you know I felt like my pole was gonna be torn out of my hands. And I get it, and it starts. I start reeling in. He's pulling his in, and the guy that we're with is you know kind of in the middle trying to help us out both. And uh, you know, unfortunately, mine dives towards the back of the boat, and the, the line actually goes across the prop that was pretty sharp and, uh, and cut the line out. And, uh, I was pretty disappointed. I had felt like I had a pretty big fish on the end of the line there. And, uh, my buddy pulls his up and had about a, a 32 inch muskie, which is pretty nice. A pretty nice size. Um, and again, some of those trophy fish get up to, to 60 inches long. So I mean, you know, just massive fish that are, you know, weighing close to 60 pounds and, um, you know, and, and above that. So it, that's probably one of them. Uh, you know, most of our stories are, are the ones about fish we lost. Um, those are, those are the ones that make the most uh, the scarring effect on you, so they stick around in your brain. <laughs> oh yeah, I um, you know, one that I, I'm not exactly always proud to talk about, but uh, I had a pretty big northern pike on the line and uh, reeling it in, and, and felt like I had it. And it was pulling and fighting. It just felt like a real heavy fish, and it's getting pretty close to the boat. And I could see it's probably one of the bigger northern pikes I've ever caught. And Right as it gets up to the boat, uh, I have the, the hook just slipped out. And, and sometimes it'll happen if you don't set the hook correctly, you don't set it at the right time. You know, you, your hook might be stuck on a, on a part of really soft tissue that's, you know, not in the mouth of the fish and, and just not fully set. 
And, uh, you know, Northern Pike, what they're, what they're going to do is typically when they grab their prey, they're going to grab it and just basically rip side to side. Um, and so that's what he was doing, just trying to get the bait out of his mouth. And just about had him in the boat and hook pops off. And, uh, again, in my younger days, I think I was probably a little bit more prone to the emotion that I am now, but I that's a pretty choice for it. But, uh, I can't repeat on the podcast and, uh, felt really bad because there was a, a family in a pontoon not too far off that I'm probably, I didn't see you before I started yelling. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's one of those stories that, uh, you're like, whoops. All right. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to throw this line back out there and, and, and try again. But, uh, yeah, there's that. Or, um, you know, even, uh, another story that, uh, fishing out in, um, Australia doing this, uh, crab fishing, uh, trip. I've never crab fished before either. So I really wasn't sure, you know, what I was getting myself into. And so I'm thinking, you know, maybe we're going to go out the side of a dock or go on a boat and, you know, throw out these, you know, like, uh, kind of what you see on some of those Discovery Channel shows with crab fishermen, right? Like a big crab pot. And I'm thinking, all right, I guess that'll be cool. We'll see what we can pull up. And so I get there and, um, they actually have, uh, what I would describe almost like a pool skimmer, but with like a metal basket on the bottom of it. And so, uh, there's, there's a picture of it on the, uh, on our Instagram page. And, uh, so I'm like, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to crab fish with this? And so it was during low tide. And, uh, you're like, you're just going to walk out there with your, you know, basket. And when you see the, you know, flashlight and when you see the, you know, see the crab, you're going to scoop them up. And, and then, uh, so you have like a, a styrofoam cooler kind of attached to a string that you just tie around yourself and walk out there. And so the styrofoam cooler floats. And when you catch the crab, you just measure it and see, make sure it's, you know, the, the legal size and, they kind of have like a plastic little uh, gauge that you just put across the top um, and, and throw it in there. And so uh, I wasn't quite sure how far out we were going to go. So we were probably 150, 200 yards away from shore, but the water is still only about knee deep. Um, and so uh, we are kind of wandering out there with a flashlight, and you don't really see the whole body of the crab. You just kind of see some dark claws and try to go after it. And so... Uh, you know, I, I was walking out there in my flip-flops for a while, but they tried to drown me a couple of times and trip me up. So I was like, all right, you know what, forget this. I'm just taking off the flip-flops and walking barefoot here. And uh, It's a great decision in a in a place full of crabs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not great. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we're watered out there, and my brother-in-law's out there. We're looking and trying to grab a couple of them, and we, we caught a couple of them that were too small, so we just kind of t- tossed them back. And uh, we're stepping, and again, we're about as far out as we had been all day. And uh, I step down and, and just feel a pinch on my foot. And um, by my reaction, you would have thought I got this like great white or something. And I almost knocked <laughs> my brother-in-law into the water. And I'm screaming like, ah, oh, it's like it's got my foot. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so every step after that was very, very cautious. I was thinking, oh, man, you know, it's, it's going to be there again. And, and uh, definitely was more focused on what was going to bite my feet next versus, uh, you know, catching the next crab and, we get to the shore, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to be bleeding or whatever else. And uh, it was the funniest thing. I mean, you, you, there's like a small red spot, maybe the size of my, my fingernail. It was so small. So uh, my brother's brother in was kind of looking at me like, really? You almost pushed me into the ocean for this? But, uh, but yeah, it was definitely an, an interesting interesting event for sure. The crab fishing's a little bit out of your out of your typical fishing experience and your expertise yeah it's yeah it's definitely out of my expertise it was a lot of fun getting out there and uh you know just trying a different way of doing it um you know there's so many different types there's you know you got spear fishing and boat fishing too that you know are just a whole new challenge to to that part of the sport but yeah getting out there and, and wandering out in low tide is, uh, is pretty interesting and you know i definitely wouldn't mind trying it again but uh i think i might uh I think I might get some crocs or something else that might be a little bit more durable for walking in, walking into the water and, uh, yeah, do, doing that kind of uh, crab fishing. So, uh, Yeah, I'm sure that the people that do it on a regular basis have something figured out that uh, keeps them toes together. So what, uh, what are the, what, have you gone anywhere else to adventure fish, essentially, or is it there with a, with a long bucket list of places you'd like to go? Yeah, you know, it really... Uh, the, the the part of getting out and doing more fishing and, and going on those longer expeditions is probably something that's a little bit more new. Uh, really, it's just been kind of um, exploring the Midwest and getting out. There's so many different lakes here, like I said, with, with Minnesota. You've got so many different spots there. And um, really just trying to continue to expand out and, 
uh, really <clears throat> just experience different areas and see what they've got. So uh, the bucket list is forever, right? I mean, I don't think there's too many places that I wouldn't go to, to try and fish. Um, you know, some of those guys that go out in, in the middle of the Amazon and, and start going after piranhas, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, that seems like a, like a pretty cool adventure. So, yeah, the bucket list is pretty long. Uh, but outside of, you know, Australia and then uh, Ontario and uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, those have been mostly the places that, that we've gone and um, that we've fished. So, but like I said, the bucket list is, is forever long. Um, they actually do some some trips up in northern Canada where uh, they'll fly you in on a prop plane and just kind of drop you off at a lake and leave you there for as long as you as you pay them to. And uh, that's definitely uh, probably the highest one on the bucket list right now is to be dropped off in the middle of nowhere. And I was on a flight back from Seattle one time and talked to a guy who, who had done an excursion like that. And, you know, again, getting out to those lakes that are, you know, so unpopulated that are not overfished, you know, they don't really know what a lure looks like and, uh, this guy was telling me he was getting so bored catching fish, he was casting backwards and still laying the fish just about every time. And, you know, so I kind of have this, you know, fantasy in my head of that's what it's going to be like. Um, and so we're trying to see when we could uh, get something like that going and um, hopefully in the very near future. Yeah, man, that sounds, that sounds awesome. Gosh, I've, I've met a few people that have had an experience like that where they get dropped off in the middle of nowhere and get to fish or hunt and, Trip of a lifetime, you know? Yeah, and that's kind of where, you know, um, I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, you just had the the, uh, the really experienced backpacker that did the, the trip in Alaska. Oh, yeah, was, Andrew kind of the of Alaska. Yeah, yeah. So I was listening to that, and that's kind of what's just, you know, really piquing my interest is, you know, now more so than just focusing on getting out on a lake and, you know, uh, fishing lakes or fishing off a boat is really combining both of those experiences, you know, combining the, the off-trail camping, the off-trail hiking, and the, and the fishing part of it as well. So, you know, doing a trip like that into Canada where, you know, it really is kind of all of those things combined is what's really piquing my interest now um, and really what gets me, you know, excited about that next part of it. And, um, you know, that's Bermuda trip doesn't really apply to that one because it's such a small island, but uh, that's really more on the saltwater side. But, there's definitely those those parts of those experiences that I want to combine and can continue to to grow, uh, you know, in those different areas as far as you know backpacking goes and hiking and just kind of combine all of those pieces into one. The cool thing is, like here, every trail in the Alpine pretty much leads to a lake. You could piece together like every trail wants to go to a lake, a lake that with with an right. awesome view, and that's where people want to camp is close to the lake. Um, but you're supposed to stay a hundred yards away from the water. Just so everyone listening knows, at least you don't can't ride on the lake. You're not supposed to. And um, but still, people people piece together those routes for Alpine Lake fishing trips. So they'll hike to like oh, ten wow. lakes in ten days, fishing different lakes for I don't know whatever whatever's there. It's really cool. Yeah, it's just gorgeous the entire time, and you combine essentially backcountry fishing with backpacking for sure. Yeah, that's. Those are some of the experiences that uh, the Midwest just doesn't quite have to offer. I think I was, you know, telling you that uh, the last time we spoke that, you know, it's a it's definitely a different atmosphere here where, you know, you can go to wilderness areas out here and, um, you know, you can travel far to, to get to them. But uh, just to be able to, you know, have all of that stuff that close is, is a little bit of a, what really interests me as well. So, yeah, just continue to grow and learn. I mean, uh, you know, as much as I, I feel like, uh, an expert when it comes to helping people pick out fishing gear and, and uh, the camping gear and stuff like that. Um, there's still like one of those parts of me where I'm just never ending learning. You know, I just want to continue to learn from other people's experiences and um, just continue to get out there and, and do different types of things that I haven't done before. And so uh, as much as I feel, uh, you know, kind of uh, good with my fishing knowledge and, and what to do once you're out there, uh, there's definitely that aspect that I, I know there's another world out there for me to continue to learn and, and continue to experience. And that's kind of, really what we've got our, our, our sights set on now. I want to take a second to tell you about The Nomadic. It's a subscription box curated for outdoor enthusiasts by outdoor enthusiasts. So each month you get a hand-picked selection of the latest and greatest outdoor gear that's been trip-tested and approved by The Nomadic product team, which is made up of guides, athletes, and you know, bona fide adventurers. They partner with brands like Mountain Smith, Gear Aid, Sea Line, Mizu, Empowered, RX Bar, 
and a lot more. This month's theme is Relax to the Max. So one item inside is an exclusive hammock by Lawson Hammocks, an award-winning hammock maker who's been voted number one by Backpacker and Outside Magazine. So order by May 14th to get this box. So get quality gear by Brands You Trust delivered right to your doorstep monthly. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash ASP. This episode is also sponsored by CS Instant Coffee, 100% Arabica coffee with compostable packaging. And you can find them at csinstant.coffee and use Adventure at checkout for 20% off. You do know a lot about fishing and, and camping and backpacking. And so yeah. you recently started a company that um, basically is like an outdoor store online where you can kind of answer yeah. questions and you're basically offering like exceptional customer service more so than like a big box store could offer with, and you've used all, all the gear. So yeah, why don't you tell us about that? Right. What's that experience been like transitioning the passion to building the business? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I've always been, uh, kind of an entrepreneur in, in the sense that, you know, I'm always looking for different ways to, you know, whether it's solve problems or, or help people out. And, um, you know, looking at just how e-commerce has really transformed a lot of, um, you know, different, the way we shop, really, right, the way people get their stuff. And a lot of times people are just going to jump on Amazon. And when it comes to, you know, fishing gear, being able to go and talk to somebody and say, hey, you know, I'm going on a fishing trip. This is my first time. Or, hey, I'm looking to get something for my dad as a big fisherman. Um, you know, really trying to combine that e-commerce part with, the same kind of service you would get when you walk into, you know, a local, you know, fish and tackle store in Westfield or Westfield, Wisconsin, you know, and being able to, you know, um, call the, you know, the guy that we know up in, um, in Wisconsin is a close family friend of, uh, <clears throat> of mine now too, I guess I should say. And, you know, being able to talk and say, you know, he's been a professional guy in Wisconsin for like 30 years and has kind of seen and done it all and being able to just say, Hey, you know, this is what we're at right now. And, you know, what do you think? And being able to get some of that expertise, um, it's lost and when you're on the e-commerce side. Um, you know, it really is. It's You can sit there and read, you know, 100 people's blogs and you have no idea really who's, who's buying and what their experience is like and, you know, who's going to be able to set you up with the right stuff. And um, that's really what I wanted to change, <clears throat> you know, and, and be able to approach that from both angles, not just, um, you know, jump on Amazon and, and try and, you know, uh, hope that you're getting the right stuff, but really be able to say, hey, look, you're, you know, hop online, and message us from anywhere. Um, you know, our, our site's hooked up to our Facebook Messenger page, so it's, it's pretty unique. And that's something I personally monitor, so it's it's one of those things where you're going to talk to me. You know, you hop on Messenger, shoot us a message and say, hey, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, you know, you're going to get somebody that's, that's right there, and it's, you know, um, somebody's going to be able to answer your question. So, really just trying to close that gap between, you know, the expertise of people that have been out there and have done it and that are using the gear and then also the people that are looking for it um, in, in, on the e-commerce side so they can get that same experience um, while providing the lower overhead of just an e-commerce site. And um, that's kind of where it's at. So, I mean, uh, Backpack Tribe kind of started out really just on the backpacking side, uh, you know, outside of, you know, when my wife and I travel, she's more so, you know, into the beach and big city type stuff, and I'm more into the outdoors. So every single time, we really try to combine both of them. And um, for a while there, we were just, you know, we we went to Hong Kong and, you know, for, I think we were in Hong Kong, Macau for about a week and, you know, just packed out of a backpack and said, here we go. Um, and so that's really where, you know, we kind of got the idea of backpack drive from and saying, okay, hey, you know, we travel all over the world and we're doing other backpacks, why not? And we could definitely help people there with the travel and the sign. Um, you know, that's when uh, a friend of mine said, Hey, you know, we do a lot of outdoor stuff too all the time. You know, that type of stuff. And, you know, you know, I don't know why you don't uh, offer it more than just backpacks. And so I said, yeah, you, you got a point. And that's when uh, really late last year, we expanded our offerings to, to do more outdoor gear and, and more of the camping side of things, more of the hiking type of stuff. And, um, you know, including the fishing gear part of it too. And, um, that's really the goal. The goal is just to have, you know, combine that e-commerce, uh, you know, savings and, and combine it still with, uh, still having somebody to talk to for gear suggestions and, 
Uh, you know, this month we started putting together certain bundles uh, that I'm sure I'm going to be calling you again to, to help me out with some uh, some gear bundle suggestions. But really for that person that's saying, you know what, um, you know, maybe they've tried fishing a little bit and they're saying, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to get started and I want to get some of my own gear. And, you know, we've got a beginner bundle now that, you know, will get you out on the lake and get you an entry level pole, get you some, you know, a tackle box and get you some lures to start off with. And, you'd be ready for uh ready to get out there and, and start fishing or same thing with camping you know just kind of well i know i need a tent i know i need a food bag and probably a backpack to put all this stuff in and you know we've got a bundle for that and they can select different options and you know it's it's a lot of savings you know with bundling that kind of stuff it, it really helps us out on the business side as far as shipping and handling and all that part of it so we definitely pass that that savings onto the uh onto the, the customer so um yeah especially now um so you know, not that I want to mention names of competitors, but uh, Phil Capella and Bass Pro is merged now, and, and so really it's just like shopping at the same store. You know, it's it's the same thing, and so I just, I just really want to be able to provide consumers with more options and, and a little bit more, um, you know, personalized um, side of things from e-commerce. You know, sometimes it could just feel like uh, I don't know who I'm buying this from, but let's hope that uh, it fits what I need, or let's hope that uh, this is this is going to be comfortable. Um, and really being able to tie together some of those things of Again, people that have been out there that have experienced it and, and people that are looking to, to get started with a hobby. And I'm sure you can know, you know, buying gear and then finding out you don't like is a pretty disappointing experience. You're finding, you know, getting out there and being out in the water and having a real break. Or, um, you know, I was talking to one customer who was thinking about buying uh, his first bait casting reel. So, uh, bait casting reel. I don't know. Are you, are you familiar with different types of fishing reels at all? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not super, but I've done lots of being in. From Florida, we've done tons of freshwater. My dad's probably got fifty okay, reels, cool. but a lot of them are kind of cheaper. But we we got I've you know, yeah. a bait cast and um, saltwater reels, all that. Right. So yeah, so you know the difference, right? Like if you've fished with nothing but like a spinning reel before, and then you're trying to jump into bait casting, it's gonna be it's a different. Oh gosh, it's 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 a skill for sure. And, and so you know, the last thing I want is you know this this customer to to get out there and you know drop 300 or 400 bucks on a, on a high-end bait casting reel and get a bird's nest after two casts and then hate it, you know? So it's, hey, you don't like to get an introductory one. Like, well, let's start at, you know, lower price point, see how you like it and everything else. And, you know, it's still going to perform well. And if you really want to up your game and you're getting really serious about it, you can jump into, you know, some of those higher price segments and, you know, helping describe what gear ratios are on the reels and, you know, what the uh, lower weight's for, which is so important on a bait casting reel. You know, if you get, you know, some really big, heavy, you know, sea uh, or saltwater, uh, you know, reel, and you're just trying to fish for, you know, crappie or bluegill, uh, you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be uh, enjoyable at all. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the, the type of stuff that we're looking to, to help people out with. And, um, you know, right now it's it's definitely more so just about building that trust and, and getting our name out there and um, having people, you know, recognize that there were somebody that we can, uh, we can help them with and, and, and getting them on the, that next adventure. Yeah, man. I, I think that's going to be a big separator in the coming years is getting people that, you know, kind of have a general understanding of everything outdoorsy, like those big, big stores to very, very right, specialized. Right. Um, like, you know, there's only so much you can learn about every sport or about every uh, you skill and, and, and even fishing, you could probably narrow it down. I, I guarantee it can be broken easily into freshwater, saltwater, and then it can be broken into yeah. region. Then it can be broken into type of fishing and you can essentially right, be right. an expert in all of that. So I think it's just going to get more and more specific as people honestly have more and more options because it's, it's overwhelming. Oh, you know? yeah. I'm, I'm on your website and you know, there's a ton of reels and I, I don't know what to choose. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd have to talk to somebody first. Yeah, and that's it. And it's at that point of like getting to somebody on the other side, and you know, you, you can't do that with Amazon. I mean, you can ask Alexa if you should buy a spinning reel or a casting reel, and I don't think she's going to have an answer for you. But no, I don't you know, think we she's will. There yet. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> yeah, right. And so that's just we want to be able to do that. And um, you know, again, it's it's always nice to be able to support local businesses too that you know, are family owned that are uh, you know making a better living for themselves. And yeah, you know, I think. Uh, and you know, that's important too to to continue to help support some of those small businesses for those people that are doing it. Um, you know, it's it's important to continue that innovation part of it, right? If it's everything's just kind of a you know Amazon kind of part of it, then 
I feel like it takes some of that innovation out of the sport and it kind of help, it doesn't help support um, really what people are, are looking for out of it. And so I think that's another part of it that really plays a role in my ambition of uh, just trying to continue on that and, you know, looking at other people that have helped me along the way, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the lessons I've learned from my dad fishing or, you know, learning to, you know, a different fishing knot from, you know, the buddies that I've been fishing with forever. It's, those are the things that are valuable to me. And I want to, you know, I want to keep that going. I want to pass that on. I don't, I don't want to, you know, just kind of turn everything into just a click. You know, I want to be able to support that, that kind of, um, that kind of generational knowledge and, and, and experience and keep passing that on, um, you know, while helping people out, you know, get the right stuff that they need. Absolutely agree, man. And if you can keep your hands in it and keep talking to customers and inspire them to go fishing and hunting and whatever, whatever it is you want to see them do, man, that's, can't ask for a yeah. whole lot more yeah, that's, out of life, you know? Right. Yeah, that's it. And that's, you know, again, <clears throat> just getting people out there and being part of it, you know, that's that's what's important for me. And, um, you know, like you said, whether it's hunting, camping, hiking, um, you know, fishing, or kayaking, you know, we, we've got stuff for just about every adventure. So that's really where we're just really trying to help people out. And, um, you know, and it's important for, for me to, you know, meet people like you and talk to people like you. Uh, you know, there's... You know, so many other people out there that are they're doing outdoors and having such various experiences. I think this is, you know, your podcast is a great platform for that for people to just talk about those experiences. And I'm so sorry, I forgot his name again. Wait, is it Andrews? Which the one? backpacking the, the, oh, oh, yeah, Andrew Skirka. Andrews, right? And so you know, he was talking about, hey, you know, in his 20s, he really you know lived it up and went on those big adventures and did that. And, you know, I think for me, I was really stuck in such a traditional uh, pathway, you know, in my early 20s of, you know, working and going to college and, you know, like in that just traditional path that, you know, I missed out on some of that stuff uh, of being able to do that. And so, you know, what a better way now to, to involve myself in the outdoor community and help those other people that do have the opportunity to do that and, and you know, and help motivate them to, to get out there. So those are like those pieces where, again, like your podcast ties in perfectly to that of, of being able to get that community together and continue to, you know, share those life lessons and experiences. You know, I think a lot of people, it's, you know, for me, fishing isn't just a sport that I just go and do, right? It's not like me going and, you know, playing tennis or racquetball or something like that. It's, it's really like a whole different level of getting out in nature and that time of self-reflection. It means a lot more to going out there and uh, than just, you know, just kind of doing a sport. And I think that's what's good about your podcast is it helps get people to that point i think it's really really important yeah man i, I mean I, w- I went out yesterday for the first time in a while just to do a little snowshoeing with a buddy and we didn't get near as far as we thought the weather was worse than we thought and we were way more out of shape than we <laughs> realized and, <laughs> and still it was awesome yeah. it was just like we're out here yeah. There was no one else out there. It was gorgeous. The mountains were just snow cat. It was gorgeous. And it was like, yeah, we didn't do maybe what we set out to do exactly, but it's it's at this point in life it's not really about that. It's about for us. I mean, everyone's different, of course. It's just about right, we right. took time away from work and being at our homes and in in the city and got out and that's that's literally what it's all about. Not about the did I get this many miles in? Um, and so right, it, was, yeah, exactly. it was a huge success in that sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do you have any uh, hiking or camping there tips coming up before uh, maybe you have a baby in the way? So you're going to try to fit in uh, any big adventures before that happens? Yeah, the, so the baby's here. Actually, a lot before, not a lot, but some before and then after. There's a blizzard going through today. I think it's just about over, but it was pretty oh, wow. crazy earlier it went from t-shirt weather yesterday to crazy blizzard and uh i might go one more time um but yeah. we're ramping up for the season and honestly i'm just looking forward to summer i'm just gonna strap that baby on my back and we're gonna do stuff. yeah there you go you know i, I mean I, it's gonna be scary i don't know and I, I might be speaking out of ignorance right now but the goal is to get it out and do little things here and there right my son was on a plane next six months and you know, my my son now is what he's a little over two, right? He's two and maybe three months or so, and he's been in more countries at two, yeah, almost you know, just short of two and a half than I have been in. And uh, so, I mean, it's it's one of those things where you just, we just put him on a plane and we just say we're going to do this. And you know, we flew back, so uh, when we went to Australia, we also um, 
we stopped in Bali and uh, in the Philippines as well. And the flight back was about 22-ish hours with a two-year-old, and it all works out fine, man. You just figure it out, you adapt, and uh, you make things happen. So, I mean, it's, you know, we did that trip, and then I think when he was about a year old, how old is he? Yeah, a little bit over a year old. We were out in Dubai doing a safari out there. And, you know, it's one of those things. You just you learn how to adapt and find ways to get it done. If, if you really want those experiences, you'll make them happen. And uh, it'll be the same thing with this trip in, in April. So, yeah. You know, yeah, however sure. this trip goes coming up, I, I definitely love to, you know, come back home to the time and talk about, uh, you know, how that trip went. Yeah, and, and remind us, where, where where will you be going and what will you be doing? Uh, so we'll be going out to Bermuda. Um, so, again, they they got some of the best modern fishing out in the Atlantic, and we'll be doing some fishing out there. And then also that island is only, like, I believe it's 22 miles long or so, so it's not a huge place. Uh, but they also have some pretty cool uh, like camping and hiking uh, trails out there, so we'll also be doing a little bit of that. Wow, man, that sounds awesome. That's going to be fun. It's going to be nice, too, to get out of that cold windy chicago area well matthew man thank you so much for joining and talking about the world of fishing we don't get to talk about it a lot and if anyone wants to ask you some questions because i'm sure you know people don't know ton i'm sure there are a lot of fishermen that listen to the show there are they talk to us all the time but i'm sure other people have questions so how can they get a hold of you if they need to yeah no problem uh so you can find us at backpacktribe.com our Instagram is Backpack Tribal. Uh, Twitter is also Backpack Tribal as well. Um, and then also on Facebook, our Facebook page is Backpack Tribe. Uh, but, yeah, so when, when you go to BackpackTribe.com, a little Facebook messenger icon pops up. Just click that, and uh, you can definitely access and that message will go right to me. Um, we can talk about whatever you want to. Um, and then also uh, I want to extend an offer for the listeners. I really appreciate you having me on. So, to use the discount code Adventure Sports Podcast, uh, it's an extra twenty percent off of uh, any of your orders. So uh, it definitely helps uh, helps us out, and just help people uh, would definitely start looking at backpack drive when you think about getting ready for the next trip. Cool, man. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, uh, yeah. Thanks for being on the show, and and I hope uh, people have a lot of questions for you, and you get to learn even more skills because the more you teach people, the more you learn yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate the time so much, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, well, have fun in Bermuda. All right, man. Stay thanks. away from the triangle. All right? <laughs> yeah, <kidding>. exactly. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, well, have a good night. All right. All right, thanks. You too. All right, yes, sir. See you. Bye-bye. Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes, share us on social media, tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. And if you know somebody that would make a good guest, reach out. We're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now. Athletic Brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer. Go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15% on your first order. The Nomadic, the first outdoor subscription box that helps you go on more adventures with the latest gear by delivering themed monthly boxes with innovative products and an outdoor challenge to match. Learn more at thenomadic.com slash adventure sports podcast. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, go to backpacktribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.